Hello and welcome to module 4-4. We're going to do receiver front end analysis in this module, which is essentially a noise analysis, which you will see. So uh, in the last module, we looked at signal power, antenna gain, and the link budget. And today we're going to focus on this. We're going to look at what the carrier to noise density ratio is, then do the noise analysis, which involves something called Friese's formula. And that's what you'll learn in this module. So carrier to noise density ratio. Th this is a very important parameter that defines how strong the signal is in the receiver. Uh, so the, the carrier part is just the signal from the satellites, and that's a power in watts. And then we show on the denominator this term N0 here. And that's a noise density. So what that means is how much noise power there is for each hertz of bandwidth. So you see the units of that term are in watts per hertz. So the carrier to noise density ratio is in units of watts over watts per hertz. That gives us units of hertz. That's how it would be in a linear ratio. But uh, as you have seen and will see, we, we convert most things to decibels. And so as you saw, in a previous module for decibels, we, we have a power ratio here, noise uh, signal power C to noise density. And so we can take 10 log 10 of it over here. Uh, but now notice that the thing inside the parentheses is in not in not just a simple ratio, it's in units of hertz. And so we have a special unit here. Instead of dBs, we call this dB hertz, which is written here db dash hertz, which is common and equally common, you'll see it written as db dot hertz. But either way, it's pronounced db hertz. And that's the, the units that we refer to when we uh, have carrier to noise density ratio in decibels. That's a density ratio. If we want to look at the carrier to noise ratio for a signal that has passed through a a filter, then we have to look at the bandwidth of that filter and multiply that noise density ratio by the bandwidth to see how much noise power there is in total. So to get a power ratio, we would then multiply the N0 by Bn as shown in the last line. So that's the definition of the, of the noise density and the carrier to noise density ratio. So the noise density was this N0 term. And using the noise density, we'll now define another very useful parameter called the noise temperature. And what the noise temperature is, is the temperature that you would have to have a solid conductor at to generate the same amount of noise. When you heat up a conductor, like a piece of copper, the electrons move faster and faster, and that generates electrical noise. And the amount of electrical noise is given to us by this formula, Boltzmann's constant K times the temperature. So to characterize the noise density in a radio, we use this noise temperature. And you'll see that that's a very useful way of doing so. And then we have this one-to-one -one relationship through Boltzmann's constant. If we rewrite the noise power in any bandwidth, we on the previous slide, we had the noise power as the noise density times the bandwidth of the noise. And so if we just replace the noise density with the equation in terms of noise temperature, we, we see that it's k noise temperature times bandwidth of the noise. So now we'll look at the block diagram of a standard GPS receiver, or I should say the standard block diagram for any GPS receiver. Uh, no matter how a receiver is architected, you can always find the blocks shown here. Uh, it might look a little bit different. So often block diagrams of receivers look quite complex, but underneath it all will be these blocks. So let's follow through from the left to the right uh, and, and quickly review what each thing is. So the, the signal comes from the satellite. It's this BPSK signal that we've seen before, carrier wave modulated uh, by a code. So it changes phase every now and again. That signal goes through an antenna through the front end of the receiver where it is converted down to something called intermediate frequency, IF. Intermediate frequency is a frequency low enough that we can digitally sample the signal. And so the analog part of a GPS receiver is to the left of this. And then everything to the right of this is the digital part. And uh, we have a mixer here, which we will, which we will analyze uh, in the next sub module. 
And the purpose of that mixer is to strip off the carrier frequency and give us back the PRN code, which uh, is shown over here. Now, at, at that stage, the PRN code doesn't look anything like that because it's buried in noise. And really, if you could put a scope on it, what you would see is just noise. But we know that the PRN code is there because we know that that's how the, the satellite modulated the signal. So what we do to observe the code is we generate a local copy of it over here. Now, the, the, remember, the PRN code is a known sequence. It's published in the interface spec that I just showed you in a previous module. So the receiver will generate the exact copy of that code and then correlate, which means overlaying these two codes on top of each other, multiplying them, and adding up or integrating them. That's this integration stage. And if the codes are exactly aligned, we'll get a correlation peak like that. And if they misalign by a little bit, we'll fall down a triangle to the left or right. And if they're misaligned by more than one bit, then you just get noise. And so we get this kind of output. And by adjusting the code delay of the locally generated code, we can find where this peak is. And that tells us how long the signal took to us and therefore how far away the satellite is. So that's the basic architecture with one modification that all of this part here is usually replicated many times for each channel of the receiver. And each channel will be dedicated to one particular satellite. So instead of looking like this, it looks like this, where you have one front end feeding multiple parallel channels uh, so that you can uh, dedicate one channel, one PRN code for each satellite that you're looking for. And so your receiver can track many satellites in parallel. What we're going to do now is focus on the front end of this receiver, the analog part here, and analyze that. And so we put that up in the top left. And we break out the representative block diagram of what the inside, so what this block here looks like typically is shown here on the right. You will, you'll, you'll have the antenna as shown on the left. And then inside that front end, you will have a chain of filters, amplifiers, and down converters. There, there might be several of these, but by showing it as having one filter up front, a low noise amplifier, another filter, and a down converter, that's general enough that you could then analyze any particular receiver. The, the only difference you might find in, in other receivers is you might then have yet another filter, another down converter, and so on, depending on how the receiver designers decided to do it. What we want to do is analyze what the carrier to noise density ratio is going to look like at the output of the stage. Now, the, the carrier signal, we already did the analysis of the signal traveling through space. We did that in our link budget in the previous submodule. And in, so we, what we have to do now is analyze the noise. Now, the interesting thing, which you will prove to yourselves in the homework, is that most of the noise in your signal actually comes from the GPS receiver itself. Space is a cold place. The satellite is at almost 0 Kelvin. So when it transmits the signal, it's a pure signal. There's almost no radio noise. We get some radio noise from hot sources like the sun and so on. But most of the radio noise that we're dealing with comes from our receiver itself. And so we analyze how much noise we generated with something called Friese's formula. And it looks like this. It's done in terms of this noise temperature that I just talked about. And it's got this specific pattern, which you could look at and learn fairly easily. But it's, it's, it's equally easy to understand it. And I, I want to give you that understanding now by, by chasing through from, from the front of this chain to the back and see why Friese's formula is like this. So if we imagine that that we have some effective temperature for this whole chain of electronics. And so we have this effective temperature. And it's, it's got a part called the effective antenna temperature, TA. What, what that is is not the literal temperature of the antenna. It's just an, a noise temperature that we assign to the antenna to give us this an analysis of the same amount of noise that we get from all the radiating sources, such as the sun, et cetera that radiate in some kind of noise in the GPS band. And we say, what would be the equivalent temperature of a conductor that generates that same amount of noise? And so we just assign this value, TA, which is you can look up in a textbook. And it'll tell you what TA to assign for a typical uh, GPS receiver. So that gives us the antenna. And then 
you're going to have, apart from the antenna temperature, before we have any electronics, you have a pure s sine wave that's modulated by the PR encode, and so there's zero noise at that stage. And all the rest of the noise is going to come from these different stages. So we're going to have some noise temperature from stage one, from stage two, from stage three, and so on. And each of these noise temperatures is, is going to contribute to the overall noise, but we're amplifying the signal at each stage as we go. So if we look at, at that, what, what you'll see is that the contribution of the noise of, say, stage, stage two is going to be diluted by how much the first stage amplified. So, so the formula for how much noise one stage adds is, is given by this. So uh, well, let's just write this down. F1 for the, f the noise figure of the first stage times T, the ambient temperature. That gives us the representation for how much noise that stage adds in terms of the ambient temperature. So now that's an actual temperature, T, times the noise figure minus 1. So let's just talk about what noise figures are for the moment. For a passive component like a cable or a filter, such as we've, we've shown here, the noise figure is just the inverse of the gain of that. So you think, well, what, what is a gain of a cable? Well, it's usually a number less than 1, like 0.9 or something like that, this loss. We, we talk about it as gain, as a fractional gain. So the noise figure is just represented by the inverse of the gain. And the contribution to the equivalent temperature is as shown. For an active component like this low noise act amplifier, that's something that's actually powered, the noise figure is given to you by the manufacturer. So for example, I have a low noise amplifier here. This is an inline amplifier. Uh, you plug a cable in this end and a cable in that end. There's DC power coming in through the cable, and the signal travels through the cable. And so this is something with a part number on here. And you'd pull up the data sheet, which I, which I have here for this, you can see. And and on the data sheet, it will tell you noise figure 1.5 dB. So they will tell you what the noise figure is for an active component. So we'd have the noise figure for the LNA. And for another cable or filter, we'd, we'd have a, a passive component. We'd have uh, noise figure is just the inverse. And for a down converter, that's an active component. We'd have the noise figure specified by the manufacturer. So that's how we get our noise figures. We see that the noise added by stage 1 is F1 minus 1t. But what about the noise added by stage 2? Well, we'd say, well, it's just F2 minus 1 times t. But if you look at what the noise looks like after each stage, so that, well, there's some noise coming in from the antenna before stage 1. And then there's some gain of stage 1. And the gain's going to affect both the signal and the noise. So suppose that gain is positive for the moment, just to see how it looks. So everything's going to be a little bit bigger when it comes out. So I'm drawing noise on the left here and noise a little bit bigger. And the signal's also a little bit bigger. So the effect of the noise of stage 2 is not just its noise, but its noise diluted by whatever happened at stage 1. And then there's some gain in the LNA, usually a lot of gain in an LNA. And so what comes out of it is a very large amount of noise and a large signal. It's, it's multiplied everything that went into it. So now the effect of stage 3, F1 minus 1t, is diluted by everything that preceded it, G1, G2, because whatever noise is added by F3 is, if it's really small compared to the gain of stage 2, then it really doesn't matter that much. And that's why that dilution effect happens. And then we've got the same thing going on, the noise going into Stage 4 is a function of how much amplification came before. And so the noise contribution of stage 4, F4 minus 4, 1 over t, is then diluted by everything that went before. And so you see the pattern. And hence, we get Friis's formula. So if you remember the pattern, it's easy to remember the formula and understand it. And so with that formula, we've characterized the whole front end. And we can then work out the noise power density coming out of the front end, which is just Boltzmann's constant times the effective temperature of the whole front end. And be, 
because we know the bandwidth of the filters, because we would be designing them or, or using them, using some filters that someone else designed, we would know this bandwidth, and so we can characterize the noise power coming out of the front end, the total noise power. And we're going to use that later on in uh, section five when we look at, uh, at sensitivity of receivers. We, we're going to need to see how much noise power there is in total to understand how much signal power we need before we can observe it. Now that we've, we've learned about Friese's formula, we have a spreadsheet. You begin with an antenna, and the effective temperature of antenna, remember, is not really anything to do with the antenna. It's to do with the environment. And so that's given to you by a textbook. So it's usually a number like 130K. And the textbook reference at the bottom here, Spilka explains how that number comes about. So that number is, is a given. Ambient temperature is conventionally set at 290. And then these other values come about from the receiver design. So in the, this references the block diagram we just looked at. We say, OK, suppose we've got a very short cable with no loss, then the ratio of the gain is just 1. Whatever goes into that cable is the same as it comes out, or 0 dB. Now, the next part would be an LNA. I just showed you one. This is an inline LNA. Uh, often in a receiver, you'll have a small LNA chip that sits on a board. And that will, that will come from a manufacturer, and it'll have a specification for noise figure, as I uh, showed you on that one, and also for gain. And it'll be in dBs. And typical gain is 25 dBs. The gain of this LNA I'm holding in my hand actually is 25 dBs. Uh, so a common mistake that people make when they start doing this is when they apply Friese's formula is they will use decibel values in here. But you can't use decibel values in this formula. It's all ratios. And so, But you're given decibel values like this 25 dB. If you look in this data sheet, it says nominal gain 25 dB. So we must convert 25 dB back to a ratio. So we, we just went through converting ratios to dBs. So if we had something like 25 dB, we know that that was 10 log 10 of a power ratio. I'm just going to write P ratio to fit in there. So we want to recover the power ratio to apply to Friese's formula. So let's divide each side by 10. And so now we've got 25 over 10 equals, and it's not dB anymore, now it's just some numbers. 25 over 10 equals log 10 of the power ratio. So if you raise each side, if we raise to the power of 10 on each side, we have 10 to the 25 over 10 would equal 10 to the log 10 is just the number. So that gives us the power ratio. So the power ratio is. 10 to the 2.5, which if you put that in a calculator, you will get 316.2 is equal to this power ratio. And that's the number in here. So that's something you must do given a gain or a noise figure in dBs. You must convert back to ratio. And you want to convert any dB values to ratio, and then work down the ratio value, apply Fleece's formula. So this effective temperature in your spreadsheet, you would code up the, the formula for Friese's formula, and you'll come up with that number, 296K, for this particular design. So one thing to remember, that's not the literal temperature of anything. It's an equivalent temperature for the whole front end, and it's a function of all these components that went into it. So given that we've done that, we've done a full analysis of a front end, what does that give us? Well, it means we can work out the noise power density coming out of that front end and the total noise power by multiplying by the bandwidth. And we can assign a very important number. We can assign a noise figure for the entire front end by pretending that that whole front end was a single block. So if you look at Friese's formula up at the top, suppose we only had one section. It would just be this part. And we didn't have all the other stuff. Well, in this case, that F1 was just a cable. But now we say, let's suppose F, without any subscript, this F refers to the entire front end. Well, it must, it must satisfy this formula that the effective temperature is the effective antenna temperature plus noise figure minus 1 times ambient temperature. Well, we, we know the effective temperature with that. We just worked it out. And we know the antenna temperature. It's this number here, 130K. So. And we know the ambient temperature, that's 290, that's here. So we can just solve this simple equation and work out the 
noise figure for the entire front end and put that in our spreadsheet, that very last line. We would work that out. We get a number 1.6, and the very final thing to do is convert it to a decibel value. And if you do 10 log 10 of 1.6, you get 2 dB. And that's the kind of thing, if you're responsible for choosing or designing or working with a front end, somebody might often ask, what is the noise figure of the front end? If we change this cable, how does the noise figure change? This is how you do that kind of analysis. OK, so that that you see in front of you on the screen finishes the characterization of the front end. And uh, as you've seen, we've characterized it in terms of effective temperature and in terms of front end noise figure, the last value we worked out. But now, what about carrier to noise ratio, carrier to noise density ratio that we began this video talking about? So, so let's go to that. And so we'll add a final row to the spreadsheet, as you see on the bottom here, N0 noise density ratio. And that is simply Boltzmann constant K times the effective temperature expressed in dB. So we take 10 log 10 of that. And that gives us the noise density, i.e. the power per hertz. And because we've expressed it in dBs, it's, we, the unit is dB watts per hertz. And we simply multiply the effective temperature that we just worked out by the Boltzmann constant, which is up here. And we get that number, minus 203.9. And so that gives us N0. And we started this video by talking about C over N0. So now we're ready to actually work out that number for this nominal receiver design. So let's go back to what, what is C. That's the signal strength, the carrier strength. And you remember we worked out in the link budget that that was minus 128.5 dBm if we were standing outside and had a clear view of the satellite. Uh, now, before we can relate that to N0, which is dB watts, we must, we must convert it to dB watts. And you've done that in the quiz uh, earlier on um, this week. And so to do that, you just subtract 30. So that gives us minus 158.5 dB watts. So now we've got dB watts and dB watts per hertz. We can, we can do this division, carrier to noise density ratio. And division after you've taken logs is just a subtraction. That's the beauty, one of the beauties of logs. And so it's minus 158.5 minus N0, which is minus 203.9. And that works out to be 45.4, which will say approximately 45 dB hertz. Now, we, we round it to the nearest dB because when you do your labs, you're going to be actually measuring carrier to noise density ratio values. And you'll see that they express to the nearest dB hertz in the receiver that you'll be using. So we just use integer values here for simplicity. And so there is our final answer for this design of receiver that we have. We expect a C over N0 value of 45 dB hertz. If you actually went outside and measured the real signal from a direct in-view satellite, you would see this. OK, now what are you going to measure with, with your phones or tablets? Well, let's just look. This, this is a nominal design. And there's a cu couple of values that we had to make assumptions on. And we said the LNA noise figure is 1.9. That's, that's a fairly low value. It's, it's a fairly typical value, but it's, it's quite a good LNA. And in maybe more important, we said the antenna gain is the gain specified in the interface specification from the US Air Force. And that was a 3 dBi antenna. And I showed you a patch antenna. It's fairly big. It's not the kind of thing that could fit into a cell phone. So in a cell phone or tablet, you're going to have a worse antenna. And you're going to have a different LNA. And you're going to have some interference from the other radios and, and heat sources in the device. And there are a lot of sources of interference in a phone because there's so many pieces of electronics close together. And that adds to the losses. And so we can represent all of this uh, 
is just a cleanup of what I just showed you uh, before I carry on talking about the lab. So this will be nice and clean in your notes. That's just the same thing I did by hand. And uh, for, a, for a real receiver, we can represent this in, in a simplified block diagram like this where we split out the ideal antenna from the RF losses that actually uh, occur in an actual phone. So these blocks don't represent anything that you could literally go and find. It's just conceptual but it shows you what you can actually measure. And so you, in your lab C, the third and final lab, you will go outside and actually measure the C over N0 value that you get from the direct in-view satellites. And we would expect a value of 45 dB Hertz if the receiver exactly matched the nominal receiver we just designed. But you're probably not going to get something as big as 45 dB Hertz because of the reasons I just said. You've got a, a far from ideal antenna and you've got other sources of interference in the phone. So you'll measure something like, suppose, 40 dB Hertz. And from that, you can tell that all the accumulated losses compared to the ideal receiver are 5 dB. And then you've characterized your own phone, which is quite an interesting thing to do. And so you will do that in the lab, and so that'll give you this value x. And then you can go indoors, and when you move indoors, you get a further signal loss as the signal passes through the building, and so that will lower the C over N0 value some more. The N0 value doesn't change just because you go indoors, and so the C over N0 value that you measure indoors will allow you to work out what this y value is, so you can actually characterize the building. So this is quite sophisticated work you can do and you will do in Lab C.